Hello, everyone. I'm Keiko Nakamura from the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition, Nagasaki University, Rekna. So I'm very honored to serve you. Hello, at, at the research. Is that okay? Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, we would like to share an opening message from Mr. Kazumi Matsui, President of Mayor for Peace and Mayor of Hiroshima. Hello everyone, my name is Matsui Kazumi, and I am the mayor of Hiroshima. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the participants and viewers of this webinar for joining us from all around the globe. Mayors for Peace implement various initiatives to promote the culture of peace, a culture in which citizens can maintain a day-to-day -day living environment where positive thinking comes more easily without the presence of war, conflict, discrimination, prejudice, or any other forms of violence. In doing so, our paramount emphasis lies in fostering peace consciousness among the younger generation, as they are the driving force of the future. We are thus committed to stimulating and supporting efforts for the provision of peace education to youth, as reflected in this peace education webinar. Today, we have the honor of welcoming Ms. Keiko Nakamura, Associate Professor at the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition at Nagasaki University, as our facilitators, who will drive a lecture on the international situation surrounding nuclear weapons. The program will be followed by presentations by young people who are passionately engaged in peace activities in different parts of the world. Whether you are already engaged in peace activities or are considering how you can get involved, this webinar offers an invaluable learning opportunity for everyone. So we hope you will stay with us until the end. In closing, it is our hope that this webinar will help the culture of peace take root in civil society and create momentum for the realization of a peaceful world without nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that was the message, opening message from Mayor Matsui. Okay, so now uh, before moving on, let me explain a little bit about the, today's program and also give you some instructions for the Q&A. So after my, I think um, uh, we're gonna see some outlines for the today's program on the screen, are we? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, after my brief lecture presentations about the current nuclear issues, you you will hear, uh, we're gonna move on to the presentations and the discussions by the young people, the youth engaged in various peace activities around the world. So we have today nine wonderful young students from all over the world, from seven cities. Now all the speakers should be appears on the screen, right? So how are you guys doing? Good? Okay, I can see the big smile. Good. So today we will hear uh, their presentations, but I hope that this webinar will be the opportunity not only to hear what the, those young people are doing, but also to, you know, the opportunity to think deeply like how people all of all generations from all over the world can work together to accelerate our actions toward a world free from nuclear weapons. Because as you all know, the world is increasingly divided 
and the situation is so tough. The risk of nuclear weapon use is growing. So it's precisely because this difficult situation that today's well webinar is important. So together with these young people, let's think about the new and creative next step for peace and for the world free from nuclear weapons. So we can do it. Okay. Um, and also, I would like to explain a little bit about how to ask questions for the audience. Today, we have an audience via Zoom, and also we have an audience from the live stream on YouTube. So those of you who are joining via Zoom, you can write your question or comment in the chat box anytime during the presentation. So doing so, please make sure to mention to whom you want to address the questions. After all presentation and discussions, I will try to introduce some of the questions as long as time allows. But please kindly, kindly note that those on YouTube are not able to ask questions. I appreciate your understanding and the cooperation. So let me begin my presentations. Could you share the screen for me, please? Thank you. I hope my presentation, which is about the 25 minutes short one, but uh, will be a part of the basis of the discussion later. Next slide, please. Oh, before that, okay. So let me start by asking you a question. What does number mean? What this number stands for? Does it look familiar to all, all of you? Anyone? You can speak up. The number of nuclear weapons existing on Earth at the moment? Exactly, thank you so much. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the... 12,520 is the estimated total number of nuclear warhead in the world as of June, 2023. So what you see now on the screen is a poster that we RECNA produce every June as a tool for the peace and disarmament education. So we provide this to the, the many schools and universities and the libraries and so and so on. So this poster illustrates the status of the nuclear warhead possessed by each of the nine countries. You already know who are the, those nines. United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. So by the way, the, um, the warhead is a part of the nuclear weapon that caused the actual explosion. Okay, so you can see the small missile shaped icons. So each missile shaped icon represents five nuclear warheads. And then the difficult, different colors icons represent different type of nuclear warhead. The orange one is a warhead loaded on a missile launched from the ground including like ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. And the blue is the ones launched from the sea, such as SLBM, Submarine Launched Ballistic Missile. And the green one is the one launched from the air, such as like from the bombers. Oh, I forgot to ask the click. So I want to show you the photos. Can you click three times? This is from the land, this is from the sea, and this is from air, okay? So, and the gray icons, you can see, you know, possessed by the US and Russia. Those icons represent nuclear warhead that have been retired due to the aging or other reasons and are awaiting for dismantlement. So as you can see, 
about 90% of all nuclear warhead existing are owned by just two countries, United States and Russia. So the other countries, other seven countries has much fewer in terms of numbers. But currently, China, India, Pakistan, and North Korea are believed to be expanding their nuclear arsenal quite rapidly. Next slide, please. So this graph shows the changes of the total stockpile of the nuclear warhead. Nuclear weapon entered to this, uh, our world in July 1945, when the United States successfully conducted a nuclear test and became the world's first nuclear armed country. So surprisingly, they successfully conducted the first test just three weeks before Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. So that was a pretty new technology. Then the number rapidly grew. As the Cold War intensified, number of the nuclear warhead increasingly rapidly, and then its peak, which is about 1987, there were nearly 70,000 nuclear warhead existing in this world. And the Cold War ended. And since then, you can see the number has been significantly reduced. So when I show when I show this chart to my student in my you know Nagasaki University, some students is going to get delighted. They're so happy, you know. They said, if the things continue as they like, maybe you know within twenty or thirty years, the numbers of the warhead will be reduced to zero. What do you think? Do you think it's gonna happen? Hopefully, yes. Next slide, please. But unfortunately, the attitude, mindset, and policies of the countries that rely on nuclear weapons have not changed much since the Cold War. Because they believe that the nuclear weapons are essentials, you know, they're crucial for their security. And even now, the countries are now relying more on nuclear weapons in response to the deteriorating international situation, especially after the Ukraine war started. So such a situation is evident both in terms of the quantity and the quality of the nuclear weapons. I think you remember that I have said that total number of the nuclear warhead has been decreasing, which is true, but please note, what is decreasing are the gray icons that are introduced. So which are the warhead that has been retired or waiting for dismantlement. So in other words, the number of warhead that are ready to be deployed and used at any time are now actually increasing. So I would say that those, those deployable active nuclear warhead are increasing now. So especially during the last five years from 2018 to 2023, the number of such active deployable or already has deployed nuclear warhead in nine countries are increased by 336. And then this number is expected to be expanded much quicker from now. Next slide, please. Speaking of quality, one of the worrisome trend is called nuclear modernization. 
So like cars or washing machine or fridge or computer that you have, nuclear weapons have a lifespan. So we cannot keep maintain it forever, okay? So the many nuclear weapons, many nuclear warheads produced during the Cold War are now aging. So to address this problem, all nuclear armed countries led by the US and Russia are undertaking large scale modernization programs spending billions of dollars to maintain more efficient, reliable, and powerful nuclear weapons system so that they can maintain them for the next 50, 70, or even 100 years. So I'm not talking only about warheads. Modernization program also include the development of more advanced missiles, bombers, submarines to deliver nuclear weapons. Also nuclear related facilities and the testing sites. So nuclear armed countries are also investing on people, young people like you, you know, young scientists, researchers, technicians who can support and sustain the future nuclear weapon industries. Next slide, please. So the situation right now is critical. So what you see is one of the symbol of the current crisis. Can you see the clock in the middle? Do you know the name of this clock? This is quite a famous symbol. Phoebe, I see you are nodding. What is the name of this clock? I believe it's the, the doomsday clock. Exactly, doomsday clock. Next slide, please. In January of last year, the doomsday clock was reset to 90 seconds to midnight. 90 second midnight is actually the closest we have ever come to the end of the world, end of the human civilization. So of course the form of threat is different from the time of the Cold War era, but clock is warning that humanity is on the verge of extension now due to nuclear weapons, and the other technologies human has been invented. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Next one, please. So let's go back to these uh, numbers. So now you know this number represent the number of the nuclear warhead existing in this world. But at the same time, you guys know that this is not just a number. One of the things has been contributing, you know, accelerating this crisis is fading of the nuclear taboo, I think. Nuclear taboo is the consistent consciousness that nuclear weapon, which cause irreversible harm to humans and the environment should never be used again. And in Nagasaki, we always use this phrase, Nagasaki should be the last place to be suffered from the nuclear weapons. But we don't know, we can maintain, we can keep this phrase forever from now because 78 years has passed since the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombings. And even in Japan, the memory of the atomic bombings is becoming a thing of the distant past. The average age of Hibakusha, Hibakusha is are the survivors of the you know, bombings. The average age is now over 85. And the number of those people 
who can speak directly to us about the inhumanity of a nuclear weapon decreasing every year. So I'm sure that many of you here joining this session have heard the testimony of Hibakshus. And then some of you may have a chance, you know, even beside the Japanese students, may have visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki, including the Peace Memorial Museums. So the reason why it's important for people all over the world to know about experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what happened to them in the 70 years ago, is not just to feel so sorry for the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but to learn the lesson from it. Experience of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki can give a clue to everyone how to understand the current situation, how we can see this world properly. The experience of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki clearly show us how much damage that even single nuclear weapon can cause. The nuclear weapon is small one considered to the you know, current standard. The average nuclear warhead is 10 times or 100 times or even thousands times larger than the Hiroshima Nagasaki atomic bomb. Next, please. So why we need those knowledge both in our head, also in our mind. Let me give you one example. I have introduced this news article to my student in my class in Nagasaki University. It's about the US deployment of low yield, like small scale nuclear warhead during the Trump administration. When I ask my student what their impressions about the term low yield or small nuclear warhead. Actually, many say, many of the students said it would be powerful enough to destroy like one classroom or one building. Some of them even said that since they are the small enough so that the damage could be contained, like limited, and it would not cause much harm. But actually, using this example, the explosive power of this particular low yield nuclear warhead deployed by the US was seven kilotons. That means about half of the, the Hiroshima bomb. So compared to the average nuclear warhead in the world today, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb can be said a small low yield nuclear weapons. So if you know how much disruptions that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bomb actually have caused area-wide and also time-wide, you know, you can never say, oh, small nuclear bomb, why not? What's wrong with it, you know? Next slide, please. So I think the key to understand the nuclear issue now is power of imagination. Of course, that you know, accurate, concrete knowledge is important, but also what is lacking now in the current world, I think, is power of imagination. We need to be able to imagine that the nuclear weapon is not abstract concept in the international relations or international policies. But it's a dangerous weapons that actually kill people, threaten our security, threaten our world every day. And that once they are used, our daily lives would be completely destroyed. 
it never returns. I will now show you two pictures. They are aerial photos of Nagasaki taken by the US military. Next slide, please. So this is the first one. This aerial photo was taken a few days before the bombing. This is over, you know, about, uh, I don't know how many meters, but over the uh, area, which was totally destroyed by the nuclear weapons. So few days before the bombing. So let me show you the second one. Next slide, please. This photo was taken about one month after the bombing in September, 1945. So I use these two photos in my class. So when I ask my student at the Nagasaki University, what has been disappeared? Can you show the last one? Can you go back one slide? Thank you. And the next one, please. So what have been disappeared? Most of the students respond like buildings, houses, streets, school, groceries, hospitals. Yeah, they're right. But do you have any idea, anyone? What have been disappeared? You can speak up. Uh, the people and the communities. Yeah, thank you, Phoebe. Yes. What has been lost is not only what is visible, right? Everyday lives of ordinary people, the bond of family and community, culture and history, and the dreams and the precious things that each individual had. Next slide, please. So I think one of the first things you learn about the atomic bombing is the number of the victims. So what you see here, about 40, I mean, 140,000 people died by the end of the 1945 in Hiroshima. And then 73,000 people died, killed in Nagasaki. But I want you to think that each of them had name. Each of them had friends and families. They had favorite things. They wanted to go somewhere, place to go, and they had dreams for the future, just like you. Can you go to the next slide and then another next slide? One more. So since um, the two years ago, my organization, Rekuna, has been collecting photos in Nagasaki, which were taken before the atomic bombings. To date, over 6,000 photos has been collected. And most of them shows the ordinary people's lives with a family and friends. Next slide, please. These photos, oh, can you go back one more? Can, these photos were also taken before the atomic bombings. Originally, they are the black and white photo, but we use the AI, artificial intelligence, to put the colors. So this is not the real color. But I want you to feel that they are so vivid and they look like nothing different from what we see every day in our current life. So I always using, you know, use these photos to tell my student, in order to talk about the nuclear issues, of course, we need good knowledge. We need to have accurate understanding about what's going on in this world. But also at the same time, we need a sense of humanity. We need a sense of, you know, 
feels others' pain, compassions, imaginations. Next, please. So as you know, click one more, please. The TPNW, Treaty on the Prohibition of the Nuclear Weapons, has been focusing on human securities. It's a clear statement that nuclear weapons do not protect us. Next slide, please. So under the TPNW, there has been an ongoing movement to focusing on more toward people's sufferings, each individual's, not the national security. So one such example is the damage caused by the nuclear testing. As you already know, more than 2,000 nuclear tests has been conducted all over the world and has created so many scars to people and the environment. Next, please. But unfortunately, still the idea that the nuclear weapon will protect us, nuclear weapon is the only thing can prevent nuclear war. Nuclear weapons are essential for peace and security. You know, those ideas are so persistent. The world is increasingly divided over the value of the nuclear weapons. Next slide, please. And I think the problem is not about the government. We are not only talking about government, but also those division, those barriers exist in people's mind. Many people, even in Nagasaki, I'm being so honest, even among the people in Nagasaki, there are so much like strong belief that nuclear weapons will not be eliminated. A world free from nuclear weapon cannot be achieved. I'm showing you one of the results of the student survey that I conducted years ago. I've been doing the same things, you know, repeatedly, but I almost get the same result. To the question asking about how possible to achieve a world free from nuclear weapons, over 95, almost 95% 95 of the student reply it's impossible or almost impossible to achieve that. So people are so pessimistic. And those students say, there's nothing we can do. We are so powerless. We don't have voices. And then, you know, even though Hiroshima and Nagasaki has been appealing, and many people around the world has been appealing to the world free from nuclear weapons, it's just idealistic. It's just distant dream. Okay, so this is my end of the presentation. My question to you guys is how are we going to respond to such claims that nuclear weapon will not be eliminated? I'm sure that I can find the answers from your presentation from now on. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's moving on to let's move on to your presentation. Sorry, I talked too much. So now your turn. So I each of you have about five minutes, and uh, here uh, let's see. So the first presenters, uh, Miss Himari Ideno and Ms. Miku Oda from Hiroshima Municipal Funairi High School. So Himari and Miku. Hi. Whenever, yeah, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. We are pleased to be given such a nice opportunity. I'm Miku Oda. And I'm Himari Reno. We are from Hiroshima Municipal Funairi High School. 
Next. Today we are going to talk about these things. Next. All our activities were started from Hiroshima Youth Peace Volunteer. The main activity of this volunteer is to guide around Peace Memorial Park for falling visitors. Besides it, we share our activities on Instagram. We started these activities because we were, we were interested in communicating with people all around the world by using English. At, her, at first, we didn't, ha we didn't have enough confidence, but as we learned about peace, we could realize how important it is to convey about history of Hiroshima. If you are interested in our activity, please check out our Instagram. Next. With joining that volunteer as a starting point, we started to widen our working field. We applied several activities and have been involved in the 2023 G7 Hiroshima Summit. We handed shovels to G7 leaders, and I joined G7 Hiroshima Summit Junior Conference, and that experience made me realize that I can be involved in international society, even the youth. And I also joined Youth Caravan, I can feel the differences of where we're thinking about peace by interacting with many people who have different backgrounds. And by learning Holocaust and interacting with people from another country, I strongly feel that I have to take an action not to repeat this history. Next, please. As activity at school, we made joint declaration of peace with, with high school students in Nagasaki. We declare what we have to do in order to make a peaceful and sustainable world. And also we discuss peace with students from Nagasaki, from Gaza district. The impressive words of them is that the recovery of Hiroshima is our hope. These words remind me the importance of conveying the history of Hiroshima, especially before and after the atomic bomb. Next. As members of Mayor for Peace Youth Delegation, eight students from four different schools visited the Vienna International Center last summer. Next, please. On July 31st, we attended to the first session of the Preparatory Committee for the 11th NPD Review Conference. Next. Uh, next, please. Ah, sorry, go back forward. We had an opportunity to meet Ms. Nakamitsu, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, and handed over signatures for nuclear abolition, which we had collected. Throughout meeting, we could realize how important it is to never stop trying to find another way we can do for making a more peaceful world. And on August 1st, we attended the youth forum. At the forum, the youth from various countries and groups were invited and introduced their own activities. Other participants gave us comments and advices that we could not find by ourselves, which was a very learning for us. We met Ambassador Ogasawara of the Declaration of Japan to conference on disarmament. We could know the current situation in Japan throughout meeting, and it was a big opportunity for us to think about a realizable solution for nuclear disarmament. In addition, we visited Otakuren district and interacting with local students. Discussing with people who have different backgrounds gave us new perspectives and flexible thinking. Next. We think that the biggest problem regarding to peace activity is the difficulty to join peace activities. I think some people seem that it is hard to approach. We came up two solutions. First one is to give an opportunity to exchange their opinions freely. I think it might be hard for some people, especially who, who are not familiar with peace activity, it might be hard to talk about peace. So as a first step, I think it would be better to make an opportunity to talk about anything freely, more casually. And as a second one, we want to share our experience. 
at first we we don't we didn't have a lot of, of we didn't have a lot of knowledge about history of Hiroshima or atomic bomb. But even even us, we can guide around Peace Memorial Park. So I want to share our experience. Next. And as a particular way, we want to do these things. Next. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Himari and uh, Miku. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Ms. Phoebe Lockett from the Wellington City Council. Phoebe, the floor is yours. Kia Dakota. Hello, everyone. My name is Phoebe communications advisor at Wellington City Council and I'm so excited to be invited to a panel of such amazing young peace advocates. Um, thanks for putting your presentations together. Um, next slide please. Uh, sorry slide please. I've recently returned from an incredible internship at the Mayor's of Peace Secretariat in Hiroshima um, I had the honour of travelling overseas to work in the Secretariat, participating in peace activities, cultural engagements, meetings with the Habaksha, and discussions with local dignitaries in order to develop peace initiatives in my home city. Um, this trip actually included uh, some brilliant students from Hiroshima Municipal Funari High School and a talk from Melissa Park, Director of ICANN. So I'm really happy to be hearing more from your groups again today. Um, so I found this internship really life-changing. Growing up in New Zealand where stories of bombings, let alone nuclear warfare, are not recounted firsthand, it's never been clearer to me that understanding the atrocity of nuclear war is a fundamental element in never repeating it. But um, a challenge in my work is the re-education about nuclear weapons for my community, who have been privileged to not have to actively think about them since we declared New Zealand nuclear-free in 1987. Um, but I've returned home now. I would like to share some of our city's current and future initiatives. Slide, please. So a permanent peace initiative in Pornicky, Wellington, is the Wellington Peace Garden. So this peace garden hosts many important reminders of the harsh realities of nuclear war, and it urges for peace. So some features of this garden include a peace flame that was originally ignited by the peace flame in Hiroshima. Um, it also has a stone from the former Hiroshima City Hall before the A-bomb hit, and a section of Hone Tufere's poem, uh, No Ordinary Sun, which is an allegory of atomic apocalypse. We also have a, a camphor tree, which originated from a survivor tree from Nagasaki that was gifted to us from a cutting. Slide, please. Another initiative is Tumanako, which means hope in Te Reo Māori, which is our Indigenous language. Um, and this is an annual art exhibition for young people that supports a, um, an inclusive New Zealand where all lives are celebrated and we promote a nuclear-free world. So the aim of this exhibition is to let young people learn about the root causes of violence and promote peace. So the first one was held in Wellington in 2015 um, to commemorate the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1955 and is now held um, annually around Hiroshima Day. Next slide, please. Um, a peace initiative that kind of became dormant, but I'm working with Soko Kakai International New Zealand on bringing back this year as part of my internship is the Wellington Peace Heritage Walk which links key people and places in New Zealand's peace history. Um, and this is to highlight and educate um, the participants of the walk by guiding them around our existing peace monuments um, to make them more known, accessible and appreciated. Um, we also host guided tours of the Botanic Garden that I showed you just before. Slide, please. Um, as part of my internship, for Mayors for Peace. I'm currently working on a few initiatives myself. So one of these initiatives is contacting New Zealand's member peace cities um, as part of Mayors for Peace and asking if they would be interested in receiving atomic bomb survivor tree seeds um, for their city. And we hope to encourage participation in this Mayors for Peace initiative 
in a way that unites the cities of my home country. Um, and as I said before, I was really blown away by the power of Hibakusha testimonies to inspire peace. Um, but something I hadn't considered that I learned while in Hiroshima was that we have Hibakusha close to home in Australia and the Bikini Islands. So I'm hoping to share their stories as well. Um, slide, please. So thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. Um, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Melissa Park, director of ICANN, which is, if you think you're too small to make a difference on your own, you've never spent a night in a tent with a mosquito. So keep up the good work, peace advocates. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. I love the last one so much. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. thank you. Okay, next uh, presenter is the... Uh, Mr. Fong Yong Chi from the University of Malaya. Fong? Okay. Uh, okay. Hi. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Ho Yong Chi. Uh, I'm a final year student of University of Malaya from Malaysia. So today I'm going to present the peace activities done in the past few years. So my peace activities done was under the Hewa Club. So please let me introduce what this club is about. Next. In 1996, our advisor, Dr. Nasruddin, brought University of Malaya Japan Studies students, visited Hiroshima, and had an opportunity to meet with the mayor of Hiroshima. After they met and discussed, Dr. Nasruddin started to offer security issues of East Asia course for the first time in University of Malaya. In 2006, Dr. Nas met with Nagasaki Foundation for the promotion of peace, and henceforth started the Asian Peace Network, which also named APN. APN Malaysia chapter was established, and then Hewa Club was formed in University of Malaya. Since then, Hewa Club organized and co-organized various peace activities until now. Next. The first activity is that me and my team created a Hewa project website. This is to uh, record the activities that we've done and shared to the public especially to the peers and students in University of Malaya to inspire them to join and participate in any kinds of uh, peace movement. Next slide, please. In 2021, me and my team had organized a webinar named International Talk, TPNW and Story of Kibakusha. We invited the Soka Gakkai speakers to talk about the TPNW and its significance in the global efforts toward nuclear disarmament and peace. Also, we invited the third generation of Hiba Kusha to represent her grandfather to talk about the story that he faced during the bombing tragedy. These activities had raised the awareness among the participants. We were initially had some challenges in finding the credible and suitable speakers due to the lack of connection, but with the help of our advisor and the Hiroshima Youth Peace Volunteer Organization, we managed to make this webinar succeed. Next. We also designed Hewa t-shirt and hoodies to share the meaning of peace and to collect fundings for the upcoming activities. At first, we were hard to design the t-shirt that can deliver peace message and attractive to the public, but then the online survey helped us to solve these problems. Next slide. In the past few years, we also actively sharing the peace-related issues in social medias, such as Instagram story continuously to spark meaningful conversation about the peace building with the youngsters nowadays. But the challenges was that it is hard to get wider followers as some may not be interested into this topic. Next. Last year, uh, we had organized a activity named Street Voice for Peace interview in University of Malaya to ask the students about the international issues such as the Russia-Ukraine war and their views and how they illustrate the peace. These activities provided a platform for students to express their insights. The interviews somehow have some obstacles that some students may not be very concerned about the international issues due to the geographical location that Malaysia is quite far away from all the chaos situation and they only know little knowledge of those incidents. But we had received different kinds of answers and opinions and from the result, it shows that majority of University of Malaya students are very concerned about humanity and peace and their support for peaceful negotiation. Next, please. Okay, nonetheless, the Asian Peace Network, APN, 
me and my team was honorly to have the chance to join and have discussion about the peace activities and collaboration opportunities with the uh, youngsters all around the world. Next. This slide was the pictures of all the participants from uh, uh, Japan, Indonesia, US, Hawaii, or and other countries. They are very, how to say, very interesting persons to talk about peace. Next. A few months ago, I joined the annual peace lecture organized by the Soka Gakkai Malaysia, and its aim is to inspire a world free from nuclear threats. The lecturer uh, provided us quite a lot of different views of peace. After the lecture, the participants uh, need to have a discussion part to join to come up with some ideas of what kind of values needed to promote peace. How should we voice out for those who can't? So the discussion was very interesting. Next. Okay, I think that's all from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ho. Uh, was a great presentation. Uh, the next presenter is uh, uh, Miss uh, Janina Rusa from ICANN, Germany. Janina, you have a floor. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Janina, and I'm working for ICANN, Germany. And I'm the project coordinator of the campaign Nuclear Survivors, which I will talk about a bit later as well. And but my involvement in peace activities began before my job. I was an intern once at ICANN Germany and also became a member there. And especially last year was a year full of experiences with youth around the world. And yeah, I will start now with one of them. Next slide, please. That was the G7 Youth Summit in Hiroshima. That was a great experience. It was in April last year. And we were more than 50 young people from 15 different countries. And we got the chance to meet survivors, to visit the city, and also to connect with others in advance of the G7 Youth Summit. Um, to attend the advance, the efforts for a world without nuclear weapons. Next slide, please. Um, another conference that uh, I was at was the NPT PrepCom, so the preparatory committee of the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons treaty in Vienna. And uh, this was in uh, August last year when I already entered my job. And um, with the team of ICANN Germany, we observed the conference, um, connected with other campaigners and also organized a side event. Next slide, please. Another conference was then the second meeting of states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in New York in uh, November and December last year. There we had kind of the same duties as um, at the NPT PrepCom. And in New York, I met even more young campaigners, um, especially at the, at the Youth MSP, um, which was organized by Youth for TV and W and also at the ICANN campaigners meeting. And we also organized a side event with young people from the Youth for TPW network. Next slide, please. Uh, other activities that we do, uh, for example, side events and the publishment of a brochure. Uh, this was also for the campaign Nuclear Survivors. And um, we published the brochure on nuclear justice in English and in German. And you can find this on the website of ICANN German if you're interested. Uh, featuring many affected people and also young activists uh, from all around the world. And the online events that we had so far were on nuclear testing and the atomic bombings. And there will be also an event on uranium mining um, next week on Tuesday at 7 p.m. CET. If you are interested, I would love to have you there as well. And um, this is always featuring and is featuring people that I met during the activity. So people and friends that I made in New York, in Vienna and in Hiroshima. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And this is a little preview now because in May, so in two and a half months, we are organizing an educational trip to Kazakhstan um, to learn about the nuclear history and also the testing site in the country and to talk with young people from Kazakhstan 
And we are organizi organizing this together with a STOP initiative that I also met in New York for the first time, where we created a great network um, of young people. We, we are meeting every second week right now to organize the event. And yeah, I'm really excited about this project. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry that everything was so in a rush right now, but there are so many exciting activities taking place last year. And if you're interested or need some more information or connections, just like feel free to write me an email. I can send it to the chat in a second. And I just want to say that I'm really thankful for all the opportunities that I got in the last uh, years and that I'm able to be part of um, the activities and also the community. And even though that we face so many challenges, for example, finding funding for all our projects, um, finding people to engage with, or not having enough job opportunities as well, and especially the the huge challenge of advancing the efforts for three of nuclear weapons, I am really grateful and happy to be part of it and that I have my place in here. And yeah, I just want to say that I'm so happy that we all put so much energy in it, that there are so many lovely people that have a great vision and that I'm looking forward to the future. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, Janina, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, excellent presentation. Okay, so the next presenters are Ms. Chinami Hirabayashi and uh, Ms. Noor Yasumoto from Nagasaki Youth Delegation. Chinami, Noor, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are the 11th Nagasaki Youth Delegation. Thank you very much for inviting us here today. Next, please. This is the outline of our presentation. Next, please. Nagasaki Youth Delegation is a group certified by PCU Nagasaki Council for Nuclear Weapons Evolution, a consortium of Nagasaki Prefecture, Nagasaki City, and Nagasaki University, as an official peace messenger working towards nuclear weapons evolution. Next, please. Through our weekly meetings, we decided what we want to learn and what we want to do. And we deepened our learning about nuclear weapons and the latest international situation through study groups and training programs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Firstly, we planned the Nagasaki study tour. We thought that what we learned and felt about the history of the air bombing of Nagasaki and the problem that still remains today would be very important evidence that could move people's heart and mind as we appear for our thought from now on. Also, feeling the importance of studying the U.S. military, we decided to visit the U.S. military base in Sasebo. Next, please. In learning about the atomic bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we became interested in learning more about the two. Therefore, we decided that Hiroshima was the best place to learn about the both sides of Japan's perpetration and damage during World War II. Next, please. Next is output. We give peace lectures to students and citizens using what we have learned. Through lectures, we realize that there are people who are interested in nuclear weapons and want to know what happened in Nagasaki even if they are not from the air bomb city. But such opportunity and time is very limited. So I think the challenge is to help people outside of Nagasaki and Hiroshima continue to think about the atomic bomb and nuclear weapons and to share this with each other. Next is Noah. So I want to talk about the activities at Oprises. So we, Nagasaki Youth Delegation, observed the 2023 NVT Preparation Committee in Vienna last summer. Next slide, please. So this is our activities in Vienna, the schedule. So we stayed 10 days in Vienna, at Vienna and we observed the Preparation Committee for five days. And also we meet ambassadors and uh, attending youth forum or attending uh, receptions, so, or visiting at CTPTO and IAEA. Next, please. 
So during observing the preparation committee, we heard the words Hiroshima and Nagasaki many times. And for me, the contaminated water from Fukushima, the Taporija nuclear power plant, and nuclear weapons of Russia and China, and DPRK is the topic for the preparation committee. So it was very interesting for me. Next slide, please. So this is our biggest event in Vienna side event called Writing Peace Uniting People Through Nagasaki and Japanese Calligraphy. We held this side event in uh, Vienna and um, the concept of this event is combi combining traditional Japanese culture and peace. Next slide, please. So we also we do this event for prayer event at Nagasaki University. So many Nagasaki citizens also participate in this side event. Next slide, please. So about events, we just uh, divided three parts, three parts for this event. First, conversation. Second, writing with Japanese calligraphy. And third, share the opinion. So we realized that image of peace we are having is similar whatever nationality is or position is different. Next slide, please. Also, we meet with many ambassadors from Japan, Sudan, South Korea, US, Netherlands, and also meet with Hibakusha, Mr. Ieshima. Next slide, please. So this is end of our presentation. Thank you for listening. And these are the our SNS accounts. So Please feel free to follow us. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Chinami. Thank you, Noor. The next presenter is um, uh, Ms. Vanda Proskova, a communicator, communications and sustainable security consultant. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to, to be here. Um, so today I'd love to chat a little bit about connecting and, and empowering because without the right connections and support, we can really get nowhere. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm a communications and sustainable security consultant. I work with NGOs as well as the UN, more specifically the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs, or UNODA for short. And I have also experienced leading multiple international projects empowering youth and women globally. Um, some of you may know Fusion, um, a platform that I co-established. And I also continue to be a member of Youth for Disarmament, which is UNODA's initiative. Um, so today, I'd love to share with you just a little bit about my experience with these two initiatives to showcase how youths can get involved, but also to really highlight these two as, as resources for youths that can help us get and mainly stay empowered on our journeys towards nuclear disarmament, because I think we all here know how real burnout is in, in this field. So for the first, Youth Fusion, next slide, please. It's so a little bit of an introduction. Um, Youth Fusion is a worldwide networking platform for young individuals and organizations in the field of nuclear disarmament, risk reduction, as well as non-proliferation. Uh, we established the platform to focus on youth action and mainly inter intergenerational dialogue, building on the links between disarmament and sustainable development. Our goals were pretty simple, to inform, to educate, to connect and engage, not just our fellow students, advocates, and enthusiasts, but really anyone of any age coming from anywhere around the globe. On our website, um, you can find really a myriad of resources for podcasts, articles, blogs from our participation at various young conferences, um, but all of the content is developed by youths and predominantly for youths. And I think, it can help you learn about nuclear disarmament, but also it discusses some of the issues that young people in the field face, like not being paid enough or being subject to tokenism or not being able to participate at certain events or conferences because of visa issues. And what we do is that we really try to talk about these issues publicly because we think that if we don't share about these problems, nothing is ever going to change. But so 
what's in this for you? Um, next slide, please. We started the organization over, over three years ago now, and it really grew exponentially. I mean, last year we were touring the world conference to conference. And so last December, we, the core organizing team, decided that we were going to pause our operations um, so that we as individuals can, can sort of figure out what's next for us personally. Um, but Abolition 2000, the network under which Fusion falls, has taken over the website and our comms and everything, and is currently looking for a new group of young individuals who can take over. So this is just a nod. If you if you already have some experience with youth engagement and new career disarmament, or if you know about someone, um, please do consider contacting Abolition 2000. Um, I promise you'll have fun and you'll learn a ton. And um, I think our motto was, you know, nuclear disarmament is such a depressing field. We really need to make it fun sometimes. So that's that's what you could do. Um, next slide, please. Um, for the second initiative I really wanted to talk about is, well, more organizational in structure. Um, it's the Youth for Disarmament, a uh, youth outreach initiative by the UNODA, so the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. Um, it was established in 2019 to connect geographically diverse young people with experts and learn about current international security challenges, the work of the UN, and how to actively participate. I absolutely love what Y4D does because their programs combine arts, sports, as well as disarmament education. They organized music competitions, sports events, as well as more traditional fellowships. In, in, in the picture, in, in the slides, you can see um, a group of so-called leaders to the future who for a year participated in online learning workshops and then were invited to the UN in Vienna to participate in the NPT prep committee, um, as well as some of the speakers here. And we also presented our ideas there and recommendations for the process. But anyways, because of this diversity and its structure and the programming, Y4D and UNODA are able to reach out to youths who would otherwise not really think or do anything about nuclear disarmament, which is incredibly important. And then after getting this first introduction to the field, the youths can move on to some perhaps more in-depth programs like the Youth Leader Fund for World Without Nuclear Weapons, which I think the next speaker will talk about. Um, okay, next slide. I know I'm supposed to finish in a second. Um, quite frankly, um, as we know, it is it is pretty hard to gain experience and, and recognition in the field of international relations and nuclear disarmament specifically. But having experience with organizations such as the UNODA can be really invaluable. As is you're building your CVs or resumes, every, every experience counts. And one with the UN directly can, can truly change your career. And I, I speak from, from personal experience here. Um, plus the programmings they organize you really get to meet some incredibly individuals that you then get to call your friends. So um, I'd like to conclude by just very, well, yeah, very strongly encouraging you to give Y4D a follow, sign up for their newsletter and, and stay tuned for their future programmings because there's a lot to look forward to and they're absolutely exceptional. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks everyone. Hey, thank you, Vanda. Thank you for the presentation, full of information and very inspiring. Thank you so much. Okay, the last but not least speaker is Kiris. Uh, Kiris uh, is a member of the first ever cohort of the Youth Leader Fund for the World Without Nuclear Weapons, UN Office, Office for Disarmament Affairs. Kiris, floor is yours. Hey, hi everyone. So um, yes, so today I'm just going to briefly speak about um, the Youth Leader Fund for a World Without Nuclear Weapons um, and my experience, particularly as a Caribbean youth. Um, and I'm basically going to touch on um, what the program is about, how it's been going, why I decided to join, which is actually very similar to a lot of the perspectives of other persons who have joined the program. And it's about 100 of us, um, as well as um, objectives and follow-up um, initiatives after the program. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, briefly, why did I join the program? You know, you guys must be saying, she's all the way from Jamaica. How all of a sudden she's a part of, you know, nuclear disarmament. Well, the thing is, it's actually a really sad reality that a lot of Caribbeans are not really aware of nuclear disarmament. Um as well as um, nuclear weapons and its effects. Um, and there's a level of ignorance in the Caribbean, especially and in Latin America, where we say that, oh, you know, nuclear weapons don't really affect us. But the truth is that it does. And the truth is that, um, you know, the Jamaican motto is actually out of many one people. And when you actually take that into, into the in international stage, you have to be aware of the fact that if one, per if one country is affected by nuclear weapons, all of us are affected. And we are out of many one, you know, so um, I, basically believe that nuclear disarmament was a worldwide issue and that it need to, needed to be addressed as well as the conversation needed to be started. And so this is actually very similar to a lot of the persons who are part of the program. A lot of it was truly that they wanted to become a part of the conversation through educating themselves first um, about uh, international peace and security. Next slide, please. Okay, so the main objectives, which are my main objectives in this program, as well as um, these objectives are very similar, fairly similar to other persons in the program. Um, it was to raise awareness in the Caribbean um, about um, nuclear proliferation and a world free of nuclear weapons. Um, and in the in the program we're actually able to converse with each other and a lot of us are actually talking about you know let's bring it to the western hemisphere let's bring the conversation of nuclear disarmament over this side um particularly in the areas in the countries that don't really speak about it how can we actually collaborate internationally all together especially over this side of the world um to speak about nuclear disarmament um and then also another objective was to basically be a part of discussion and um i've been a part of discussion and it's been amazing we've been able to connect with each other through live webinars um as well as skills building workshops where we talk about negotiation where we talk about innovation and leadership um as well as um i work in the area of youth protection especially and um, I believe that I wanted to bridge the gap between youth protection as well as disarmament through um, international humanitarian aid and conversations and assistance. Next slide please. So what have we learned in this program? Um, the UN ODA has been amazing with regards to providing information and educating all of us it's a hundred of us on uh, the topic of disarmament so we've learned about the un's role in disarmament which you know um one thing that we learned is that you know the disarmament is actually at the heart of the united nations system of collective security we've also learned about the four major goals of disarmament you know which is maintaining international peace and security preventing and resolving armed conflict and promoting um protecting civilians and promoting sustainable development and we've also learned about the youth's role in the mission of world free of nuclear weapons throughout this program and this has been done through um hearing various perspectives such as mona lisa um who is a un oda leader of tomorrow and she spoke about how she became a part of discussion and how she shares about nuclear disarmament through the use of her social media you know and various things like that is very very interesting so last slide please Yes. So how have we how have I been implementing um what I'm learning? Um this is through a new youth led movement. So um we've been collaborating at the University of the West Indies, which is the major university in the Caribbean. Um as well as we've been connecting with other Caribbean islands and how we can actually become a part of the discussion um, through starting a youth initiative in the Caribbean so we can start speaking with, with each other and connecting with various persons from the program as well as from the UN ODA to start speaking about disarmament within the Caribbean and the Latin Americas. We've also started discussions, as I mentioned before, where we start to widen the audience um, so that the messages of the survivors um, and how nuclear nuclear weapons are actually very dangerous to bring it to the Caribbean so that, and the Latin America so that we can actually work together internationally because I believe that one step towards um, you know a world free of nuclear weapons is really and truly 
bringing it to the countries that don't necessarily speak about it because there's strength and unity in numbers, um, as well as sustainable impact with regards to continuing it even after um, throughout the use of the program. And also, I would like to pose to all of you a question, as I mentioned before, with this, which borderlines on an issue. How can we actually continue the conversation, not only in the Caribbean, but there are many other countries where a lot of people don't even know of these discussions, don't know of these programs. How can we bring it um, to these um, countries and these regions so that we can actually become even more internationally united um, about this message of um, disarmament. And so, yes, that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you. Okay, Kerry, thank you so much. And then thank you for all of you who had a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Okay, so now I would like to open the floor for the discussions. So um, for the discussion topic, I really, you know, I I'm sure that after listening to each other's presentation, you know, some of them are so inspiring, new ideas, new innovative ideas. I'm sure that you really feel so encouraged by each other. But uh, at the same time, I'm sure that, you know, you guys are also facing, since, you know, nuclear issue is so tough, you know, to tackle. So I'm sure that, you know, you can identify some common challenges you're facing too. So, um, yeah, I would like to invite anyone to speak up. If you want to have comments or questions to each other, please let me know by clicking raise hand button. Okay, so you can speak up anything. And then also, Karis, thank you very much. Uh, Karis, and, uh, you know, uh, the throwing questions, you know, actually some of the, the presenters mentioned some difficulties of outreach, you know, expanding their activities. So I think that's one of the common things. So if you have any good ideas, you know, to approach that, you know, you're very welcome to mention that. Okay, anyone? Please. Oh, okay. Uh, Vanda? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add on the outreach and, and hard to connect uh, question or, or remark. I think that's why the networking platforms are so important. And that's exactly what both U Fusion and Y4D does to its members. When you join, um, you can then reach out, ask them to share relevant information. I know that Y4D was an excellent partner to U Fusion and y vice versa. We collaborated on, on multiple different projects together. And they're really keen on promoting the work that youths are doing in the field. So please, please do consider, you know, or following them, obviously, but joining and, and using these so-called services because there's phenomenal people happy to jump at supporting you if, when you need it. Thanks. And thank you for the, yes, thank you for your comment. And then, you know, that's a good suggestion. But uh, let me ask you, uh, especially Vanda, um, do you also experience, you know, in the new, you know, the, um, the your activity too do you also experience any difficulties to outreach people or so far you have been successfully you know like how do you i mean like you know how do you appeal you know because most of the people i think some of you mentioned that you know for the most of the young people i would say nuclear issues is something so distant you know so diff you know it's it's nothing to do with them there is nothing they can do you know so how do you feel the gap you know, in the those kind of sense of like um, the connected, like you said, you know. Thank you for this question. I think my answer would be connecting nuclear disarmament to other pressing issues. So at Fusion, for example, what we do is connecting with sustainable development. The environmental issues are obviously very much a hot, literally a hot topic right now. Um, so connecting it and, and explaining those inner linkages, you know, we cannot talk about um, climate change and omitting um, our armies and our weaponry and nuclear disarmament, obviously, and, and vice versa. So really um, underlining these connections and that that's been super, super helpful. And it doesn't have to be just the environment, but really all of the SDGs. We cannot talk about gender equality and forget about nuclear weapons and their impacts on, on individuals. And then my favorite 
thing to talk about, especially when we do student roundtables, is the money aspect of things. And that works very well, especially in the Western world uh, with, uh, you know, in country like the US where they don't have a universal healthcare system and the colleges are ex ridiculously expensive. And when we do maths, like how many seconds of nuclear weapon spending would cover your student loan? And it goes to, it's so applicable and it really, I think a lot of young people are struggling financially. Um, so it's, it's a good, it's a good hook. Um, but there's, there's so many linkages. So yeah, connecting it to different fields, sort of make it more relatable and relevant to people. Great ideas. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, any other, yes, same question, like how to expand the outreach activities or any other point you want to raise? Phoebe, you want to say something? <laughs> Sorry, spotlighting you. <laughs> oh, um, my point was actually <laughs> quite similar to uh, Vanda's. Uh, you, you, you explained yourself very well. But yeah, that I just just to kind of expand, like there's, I don't think there's a single personal or country based interest that isn't directly come at threat of nuclear war you know again be it the economy or you know your family or the environment or animals like every single thing is at threat um if there was an, an a-bomb in your country or in a surrounding country and i think that is a very good key when it comes to communities that haven't experienced nuclear war or don't have to think about it super often is that you know you've got to be on top super vigilant because you know it is going to affect your interests even if you don't directly think it is but so good good point Amanda thank you thank you so much anyone yeah uh so Curious. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, in your country, they have, oh, I'm sorry, before I make a comment, I saw that, you know, uh, from Hiroshima, you guys are raising a hand. Please. As a way to accelerate our, our discussion beyond borders, I think it is important to think the matters as our own problems. As you said before, sometimes we feel the distance between us and international issues. In order to make some international problems as our own things, I think it is important to communicate from people all around the world or people who actually suffer from some problems. When it comes to my experience, I had an opportunity to talk with students from Gaza district. After I talked with them, when I see the news of Gaza district, I came up with their faces. I think this experience is important when it comes to involving some peace activities actively. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, actually, thanks to the, uh, you know, internet and also thanks to those communication tools, uh, especially after the COVID-19, of course, it's not a good thing, but, you know, we, we have more developed things, you know, about the communication, make things easier to communicate to each other. Yes, Yani, Yani, Yanida, Yanina, please. Oh, you are muted. Excuse me. Okay, so I think uh, as everybody said before, these uh, opportunities are really good. And I think for myself, I also I experienced that it's uh, even easier to start with my friends and like trying to spread the word about how important nuclear uh, disarmament is within my, my family and my friends and hope that they will tell other people about it because I also tell them about the great opportunities mm -hmm. that uh, this field is offering also that like webinars like this sharing these opportunities different initiatives uh, collaboration um possibilities is just absolutely great a great chance for us as well to uh, cooperate internationally and i think um starting at schools with young people and trying to talk to young people about the risks um is also absolutely important and yeah I think it's, sometimes it's easier to to start at a small scale and hope that everybody that you talk to will talk to another person. So at some point, everybody will be involved. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Very good point.
Okay, any other any other uh point that you want to raise? So um uh, Noah or Chinami, do you think you know talking about like you know hardship in, in the outreach? I'm sure that you know you guys in Nag even Nagasaki you are experiencing the same things. So can you tell can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences and then how are you trying to, to like you know expand the the people who can join who can be involved in that activities either one so um in nagasaki there is uh peace peace studies uh mm -hmm. in school normally uh for example we should gather in school at August 9th in Nagasaki and listen to the testimonies from Hibaksha or uh, see the pictures of atomic bombing or right, something. So, but like, I feel that is like becoming the normal. So maybe many people don't like interested in that kind of just like normal daily lives, the part of daily life. So maybe many people don't like specif specifically like getting interested in nuclear weapons. Yeah. It's hard for young people in Nagasaki. So I think this is the issue for like, uh, yeah. so, we have to like getting down the hurdle for mm -hmm. joining the peace activities and like make many younger generations mm -hmm. together to like do peace activities. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, you know, um, in both in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, maybe we need a more like new approaches toward the nuclear issue. You know, to approach people. So one of the things is, is a good idea, which was already raised, was like you know to show the clear connections between the other international issues, such as like environmental issues, economic issues, and also gender issues. You know, they are totally those. S SDGs kind of things is totally, totally related to, you know, uh, the nuclear issues. So that kind of, you know, highlighting those connections, maybe, you know, give a more impetus, more like, you know, incentive to more people, you know, because lately, uh, more and more young people around the world, of course, in Japan, are interested in like a gender and environmental issue, but they never thought it's connected to the nuclear issues, right? So highlighting such a connection will be a good idea too. Okay, Ho, do you wanna, do you wanna say something about like how to increase the people's attention on that? In Malaysia, I'm sure that you know people are already get into the issue, but uh, maybe you know involving more people can be possible. What do you think? Yeah, that, like just what I say in the presentation, Malaysia is quite far from all the issues, and they know very little about the knowledge. So I think uh, this is the this uh there's a reason for this is because the people nowadays they are. They don't want to put long effort and time into certain topics like the peace topics because they this is not related to them. Uh, so what I think is that nowadays the some the short videos like YouTube shorts or the TikTok are very popular nowadays. So uh, we can try to make the educational purpose content to become more interesting, more funny and attractive. Uh, like we can break down the complex topics into a bite-sized uh, information. Like we can do some short videos regarding the the TPNW, the the uh, bombing tragedy, something like that. And then also, I think how to attract the uh, the youngster is we need to have some awards to them for doing uh, such peace activities. Maybe we can uh, organize uh, something like peace treasure hunt something like that so that uh they can how to say they can 
use they can use their knowledge to solve all the quiz quiz piece trivia quizzes and then they can uh the winner will get a, a very excellent award prizes so this is what i think to attract more youngsters to join in the peace uh related topics yeah okay thank you Ho. it's excellent idea i really like that okay um but um unfortunately you know there's still much more things to discuss but um, you know it's time to end this session but of course you know it's not end of our communication it's not end of our networking you know maybe we you know this is the rather start you know we just are standing at the starting point and then you know we can enhance our communication from today right so but anyway so today's webinar is once again reaffirmed that the power of networking i think you know so as i said earlier the international situation surrounding nuclear weapon is not good we know it you know, but there are people, you know, has a common mind, you know, same similar mindset, you know, we can work together. We have a friend everywhere, right? So, you know, um, yeah, so, it, you know, in the difficult time, like now, it's really necessary for everyone who has to work together. We know it. And I believe that Mayor for Peace is definitely can provide continue to, uh, you know, has been providing. And also from now, we'll continue to provide an important foundation for the further networking. We really have to utilize, you know, make the best of this networking power, okay? So thank you very much everyone for joining this webinar and thank you for your cooperation. All of you, except me, speak in, the, in keeping time. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So the recording of the webinar, this webinar will be available on the Mayor for Peace website very soon. So please check it and then inform to your friends. Okay. So once again, thank you very much. And then I will return the microphone to the organizer. <laughs>